Welcome to the Almighty God and Gospel Girl podcast. Each week, you'll hear testimonies that turned failures into hope, despair into inspiration, and darkness into light, as well as actionable tips and strategies that you can implement in your daily life to overcome obstacles that can detour our Christian walk. Galatians 6 2 tells us to carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Now here's your host, the Gospel Girl, Tammy Becker. Welcome, friends. It's another exciting week in the Old Testament. I'm Tammy Becker, and this is the Almighty God and Gospel Girl podcast. Uh, This week's readings are Exodus chapters 13 through 35. So buckle up because it's going to be a two-part today as the Lord has given me a few things to talk about. But don't worry about your rabbit trails as they're at the end for your deep diving later on. So let's go ahead and get deep diving into what the Lord wants me to share with you this week from our readings, okay? So we're going to begin with the Exodus from Egypt, which is what we read in Exodus 13 and 14. So our story opens up with Moses and the children of Israel, probably about 2 million in strength, heading out of Egypt on their way to the promised land. And then we see that through a series of plagues, God not only demonstrated his sovereignty over all creation and his superiority over the false gods of the land of Egypt, but he literally broke Pharaoh's will and changed his heart. The 10th plague, which is really not a plague, if you deep dive into that, it is judgment, the death of the firstborn of Egypt. And that was the final blow that caused Pharaoh to cave in and let the Israelites go. So just to give you a little perspective on that number, take a look at the picture on my website to accompany this study for the podcast. And you can go to youministries.com, www.youministries.com and find this study there. And take a look at that picture. This is of the State Farm Stadium, home of the Arizona Cardinals. I'm from Arizona. Now this holds a whopping 63,400 fans and it is packed. And let me say again, Probably about 2 million people headed out of Egypt on the way to the promised land. Wow. Now take a look at that picture. Get what I'm saying? All right. So for the purposes of our study this morning, there are basically three things that I want you to see on the exodus of Egypt. Number one is that God is with his people. One of the great lessons we learn from the book of Exodus as a whole in a message reiterated throughout the scripture is that God is present with his people. God is a person who created us as persons in his image. He wants to be in a relationship with us. And one of the ways he makes this known is through his presence. And then number two, God directs his people. One of the most obvious things we see in this text is that God is clearly in charge. And through his presence in the pillars of cloud and fire, he has given his people direction and their deliverance dependent upon their following his directions. Notice three specific things we can learn about God's guidance as we consider his guidance out of Israel, out of Egypt. God positions us where he wants us, not where we want to be. He wanted to position them to where he was their only hope, to where if he did not deliver them, they would not be delivered. God's direction is not always the easiest way either. If we are following God's direction, we must go where he tells us and do as he says. And then God's direction always requires faith. How else could that many people file out of Egypt, right? 
No doubt, after a reversal in directions, the people began to question whether Moses really knew what he was doing. (laughs) So, like, make no mistake about it. Whenever you're trying to follow God, there will always be those who are more than ready to offer their advice. There will always be those who think they know a better way than the one God has given you. Hmm. Think about that. All right, number three, God delivers his people. So the central theological truth of this passage is that God is the deliverer, okay? That God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob is a God of deliverance. In his response to the people's lack of faith, Moses tells and encourages the Israelites to trust God. So there's like five things that tells us about God. So you can look at, hope you have your pen and paper, Exodus verses 13 and 14. Uh, Number one, he does not want them to fear. He can comfort us. Do not fear. That's in 13. Uh, Number two, he does not leave us to die. He delivers us. You will see the salvation of the Lord. In number three, He invites us to faith. He expects us to trust him, stand firm, and keep silent. Number four, he removes danger from us. He protects us. You will never see them again forever. Number five, he fights for us. He is victorious. The Lord will fight for you. So the finished work of Jesus demonstrates for us the same truths that our text today tells us about God's working in the lives of his people. God does not want us to fear, friends. He is our deliverer. He invites us to trust him. He removes the danger from us and he is victorious. So we see that Then we jump into Exodus 15 through 17, the the chapters, and we see that they're walking by faith in the wilderness. So as we observe the leadership of the Lord and his working in the lives of Israel, and as we observe the response of the children of Israel, there are five things I want you to consider specifically as they relate to our walk as Christians that we can take away from our reading in these two chapters. Number one, God calls us to walk by faith in Exodus 18, 7. We see Moses had great faith and was a humble man as in Yahweh's chosen leaders. Number two, God's direction always has purpose. In the midst of trials, which seems like meaningless to us at the time, God has a purpose. He has a purpose. How many times do we look back after the fact and say, oh, I see the purpose now. So glad it didn't go the other way. All right, number three, how about God provides for us along the way? He provides in accordance to what we need, not necessarily according to what we want. I mean, Yahweh always knows the best. He provides as we need. He wants us to trust him for our daily bread. This builds faith. He provides in unique and often miraculous ways. Number four, God calls us to be gratitude. He calls us to gratitude. In all their doings, the most glaring sin of the Israelites was the sin of ingratitude. Their attitude was one of ungratefulness and thanklessness. Instead of continuing to praise God for his deliverance from Egypt, instead of worshiping him and acknowledging his continued presence with them, All they could do was murmur and complain that he had not done enough for them. I mean, complaining is the opposite of gratitude. The very fact that you are complaining says you don't appreciate what you've been given, that you think you deserve better. When we gripe rather than give thanks, when we protest rather than praise, we are telling the Lord several things that we Deserve better than he has given us. This is sin of pride. We think we are better than the station to which he has assigned us. That he does not know what we really need. That we know better. This is arrogance. We think we are more aware of our own needs than the one who created us. That he does not really love us or he would have given us what we wanted. This is immaturity. 
Like children, we whine and complain that we didn't get what we want. Oh, man. Finally, we tell him that our unappreciativeness are not mindful of it. We're just not mindful of everything that he has done for us in the past and that nothing done for us in the past matters. Only what we want now. That is forgetfulness. Hmm. Something to think about. All right. Number five, God calls us to obedience. At the end of the day, obedience is nothing more than faith in action. It is saying, God, I trust you enough to do what you say. For the Israelites, obedience was the ultimate test of faith. God did not ask them to reason with him. He did not tell them he would rationalize his directions with them. He did not invite them to dialogue or to question and answer time. He simply called them to obey, to go where he said go, do what he said do, and to trust him to be there before them and meet their needs. We are all called to walk by faith, not by sight. We follow a God of purpose. We may not always be able to see his purpose, but it is ever there. Ours is a God who promises to provide, and he has never once failed us. His provision calls us to gratitude. So let me suggest three ways that we can live lives of gratitude. Number one, trust God to do his best for you. He is good and he loves you. Trust him to give you what is best for you. Number two, praise God for all he has given you. Count your blessings instead of your burdens. Look at all he has done and give him thanks. Number three, respond to what God has done for you. Look for a tangible way to express your gratitude to God. One way is through obedience in the area of financial stewardship. If you're not tithing, if you're not giving back at least 10% of what God has given you, how can you say you're grateful to God for what he has done for you? Gratitude, necessities, obedience. And that's the final thing I want you to see in those readings. He calls us to be obedient. He is God. We are not. Then we head over into Exodus 19, chapter 19, and we see that the Israelites prepare to meet God. Ooh, this is something, you know, I had to add on to the podcast because God was still speaking and wanted me to go into the holy God, holy people, because it talks about and it deals with specifically the subject of approaching God. And I want you to notice several things about coming into the presence of God. Number one, approaching God requires consecration. This speaks to how God views us. In verses 10, God tells Moses to consecrate the people, to set them apart, to purify them so they will be qualified to meet God. The Hebrew word employed here is from the same root as the word holy. It means to be ceremonially clean or pure, to be set apart from that which is profane and dedicated or consecrated to that which is holy. One of the New Testament words which carries the same meaning is sanctify or sanctification. As God prepares to meet his people, As he prepares to speak with them and give them the law, he tells Moses that they must be prepared. And Moses is given the task of consecrating or sanctifying them. So we do not know in great detail exactly what it was Moses did to consecrate them. But what is of importance is that we note that they had to be set apart before they were ready to meet with God. So there were two things God told them to do. Number one, they were to wash their clothes. By washing their clothes, the Israelites were demonstrating their understanding that God was holy and that to meet with him required holiness. Number two, they were to refrain from sexual activity. Not the sexual activity within the bonds of marriage was in any way like unclean, but as they prepared to meet God, As they prepared themselves spiritually, they were to abstain from any personal indulgence which would take their heart and mind off of God. 
So the lesson here is that meeting with God requires personal preparation. It means seeking him with an undivided heart and mind. It means not allowing anything else, no matter how blessed or wonderful it may be, to distract us from preparing to hear from God. And if we want to experience God as believers, as they did in the old days, we must be prepared to meet him. We must be consecrated. James 4 Verses 8 to 10 tells us four things to do to prepare to draw near to God. Number one, cleanse your hands. Stop sinning. That's what that means. Number two, purify your heart. The heart is the realm of feelings and attitudes. Number three, be wretched, mourn, and weep. This speaks to taking your sin seriously of understanding that it was our sin that nailed Jesus on the cross and that to save us from our sin was the reason he died on the cross. Number four, humble yourselves. This brings us to the heart of the matter. To be right with God demands humility. Approaching God requires consecration. It requires that we be set apart from all that profanes us to set apart unto the one who makes us holy. All right, now in section two, approaching God requires, well, you know, how we speak to him. And veneration, how we speak and view God. In verses 12, 21, and 25, we find God telling the Israelites to keep their distance from the mountain. In verse 12, God told Moses to set limits all around so that the people would not go up and touch the mountain, lest they would incur the death penalty. So two things which can be said here about God setting boundaries around the mountain. Number one, first it was to teach the people that God was different from them as was not to be approached lightly. And number two, secondly, the boundaries told them that he could only be approached on his terms. All right, section three is approaching God requires meditation. This speaks to how we get to God. The message is clear, though. It's the only way we can get to God is through Jesus. He's the mediator, the one who makes it possible for us to get to God. And the reason we have access to God through him is because his blood consecrates us. It sanctifies us or makes us holy so that we can be cleansed of our sin and enter the presence of a holy God. All right. Okay. I'm going to give you an interesting Tammy tidbit here. I love music. It is a gift from God that captures and carries that which cannot be adequately expressed by words alone. Music, said Plato, gives wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and life to everything. Music sets forth what is important to us, what moves us, what changes us, what we long for. So do you know what the first recorded song in the Bible is about? I'll give you a hint. The last song recorded in the Bible is about the same thing. The first song in scripture appears in Exodus 15. The last song can be found in Revelation 15. And both have their shared focus, the holiness of God. That's right. I did tie it in talking about holy, the holiness of God. After God demolishes any notion that Egypt's false gods were anything other than the projections of the men who worshiped them. After God delivered over a million Israelite slaves from the grip of Egypt through 10 awesome plagues and a parted Red Sea, Moses led the whole nation in a song of celebration, God's holiness. One verse captures the guest of the entire song. Lord, who is like you among the gods? Who is like you? glorious, in holiness, reverend with praises, performing wonders. Right. Okay. How about, let's let's talk about the Apostle John for a moment. When the 90-year-old Apostle John was granted by God to look into the future, he saw a moment when the final outpouring of the wrath of God was about to take place. Gathered in heaven were those whose faith, allegiance to God in defiance of the rule of the Antichrist had cost them their lives. And John tells us that they sang the song of God's servant Moses and the song of the Lamb. Great and awe-inspiring are your works, Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations, Lord. 
You will not fear and glorify your name because you alone are holy because all nations will come and worship you because your righteous acts have been revealed. Revelation 15, verse 3 and 4. In between Exodus 15 and Revelation 15, God's holiness comes up over and over again. Holy is used more often as a prefix to God's name than any other adjective. Two men in scripture who were permitted to see into the throne room of heaven and write about it both reported hearing one continuous refrain spoken day and night. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah 6, 3 and Revelation 4, 8. This is the only thing said about God in this fashion. No other attribute of his is repeated three times. So this morning, you know, I come to you to present to you these truths about God that are so mysterious, so disquieting, and so awesome that it makes me tremble. If you dare to come with me in these next few months and year, you will understand why righteous Job would say to God, I had heard rumors about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I take back and repent in the dust and ashes. If you turn aside from other distractions and draw near to the common things God sets on fire by his presence, you will understand why Moses feared to get too close and took his sandals off his feet before the bush that burned with God's presence, Exodus 3, 5. If you will look intently at this truth about God, you will join Isaiah, a man of God, who studied and thought about and proclaimed God's holiness for years before having a personal encounter with his holy name and was left saying, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and live among people of unclean lips because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Let's ask a question in this day when God is the subject of stand-up comedians and bumper stickers. What does it mean to say God is holy? Yes, sorry for the extended podcast today. However, this is so important that the Lord would have me include it before I give you your rabbit trails. There are basically two strands of meaning for the word holy. A is to be holy, is to be distinct, separate, and unique. The basic meaning of holy in the Bible is to cut away or to separate. R.C. Sproul suggests that this word conveys the same idea we express when we find a garment or a golf club or some piece of merchandise that's outstanding, that has superior excellence, and we might say that it is a cut above the rest. The holiness of God. So when we say God is holy, we're talking about one characteristic out of many about God. We're talking about the character God himself. Holiness, when applied to God, means that he is utterly unique, incomparable, matchless without parallel and without peer. In Isaiah 40, 25, God himself issues the challenge, who will you compare me to or who is my equal? Ask the Holy One and we must answer. There is no comparison. God is not just a supersized version of you or me. He is transcendently separate in a class by himself. He is subject to nothing. He answers to no one. This is who our holy God is. When Hannah rejoiced in God for answering her prayer for a son, she prayed, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. And there is no one rock like our God for Samuel 2.2. David's confidence in God was fortified by considering his holiness. Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, and there are no works like yours. All the nations you have made will come down and bow before you, Lord, and will honor your name. For you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. Psalms 86, 8 to 10. Even the name God gave his mighty archangel Michael testifies to this truth. The name is translated Who is like God? Here is the first strand of the meaning in the Bible about the holiness of God. He is not like anything or anyone we can come up with. He is above us. He is beyond us. He is so different and so rare that no one in the Bible, regardless of how devout or learned, 
failed to crumble in fear and humility, repentance, when they are caught a glimpse of this holy God. When God met with Habakkuk, the prophet, he described his reaction like this. I heard and I trembled with him. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. He was shattered by what he saw. When we see him as he is, it traumatizes us because we immediately see ourselves for who we really are. And the incongruence of, is, is just overwhelming. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot of religious technicians out there today whose goal is to make you feel comfortable with God at almost any level. They want you to feel like God is someone we can hang out with, confide in, and call on when the going gets tough, regardless of your relationship with him or what kind of life you're leading. Just know that you have to refer God as Jesus. is He's not the old man. Contrast to that bumper sticker, the next door neighbor's view of God to what God himself said to Isaiah, you thought I was just like you, but I rebuke you and lay you out the case before you. Understand this. You who forget God, or I will tear you apart, and there will be no rescuer. It is a dangerous thing to forget that God is holy. We trifle with the living God to our own peril. He is not our buddy. Our God is a consuming fire, friends. Let the mystery of who he is strike you today. He will not fit into our neat theological formulations. He cannot be defined in finite minds. That's part of what it means to say he is holy. A secondary strand of the meaning has a distinctly moral focus. To be holy is to be absolutely pure. Holiness is being set apart from anything impure in order to be completely given over to what God says is pure. When you apply this meaning to God, his holiness points to what 1 John 1 5 says. There is absolutely no darkness at all. James tells us God is not tempted by evil and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. Habakkuk 1 13 adds that God's eyes are too pure to look on evil and cannot tolerate wrongdoing. In a word, God is perfect without sin, flawless. So blazing is God's purity that the sinless seraphim who serve him in heaven cover their faces with their wings. Hmm. Isaiah 6, 2. Job 4, 18 declares God puts no trust in his servants and he charges his angels with error. Wow. A lot to think about. A lot to think about. The final point is Only holy people can see God pursue peace with everyone in holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Hebrew 12, 14. Holy people see the holy God. Unholy people will never lay eyes on him. Your iniquities have built barriers between you and God, and your sins have made him hide his face from you so that he does not listen. Isaiah 59, 2. So what hope have I? Because fundamentally, essentially, by nature and by choice, I am a sinner. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not set his mind on what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully, he will receive blessings from the Lord and the righteousness from God of salvation. Psalm 24, 3 to 4. But my hands aren't clean and my heart is not pure. Sometimes I offer up my time and my energy to be entertained by the things I know that are based on lies. I will never climb to the holy heights where God dwells. Well, 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16 makes it even more blunt. As obedient children, do do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you holy, you are to be holy in all of your conduct, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. But my life is not holy. My days are riddled with sin. My heart is attracted to sin. My mind tends to justify sin. I'm so bent towards sin and its ways that Jeremiah tells me that I struggle just to identify myself. Jeremiah 17, 19, 9, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Folks, it goes on and on and on about what we can talk about with holiness for God. Let me close with one question. What difference does God's holiness make in my life? What does it make in your life? 
A, saving holiness? Do you have the holiness of God working for you in Christ? Or is his holiness set against you? Have you fled to Christ deliberately, personally, trusting that what he did on the cross is your only hope of being right with God? Or are you still carrying your sin and an appointment with the fierce wrath of God? B, serving holiness. What is the evidence in your daily life that the Holy Spirit of God indwells you? Does your behavior, your choices, your habits, your language show that you are in the language of 1 Peter 2.9? A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light? Hmm. Boy, you guys got a lot to think about today. God gave me so much for you. Two for the price of one, right? All right, and I didn't forget your rabbit trails. In order... In order for the two million Israelites to get out of Egypt, there had to be some kind of an order. And that order was tribes, clans, and households. You need to draw out this chart. You will not believe it because when you go to draw out, kind of like a genealogy chart, you might really enjoy doing this. Here's your scriptures to go to. See Exodus 1, 1 through 5 for the listing of the tribes that had gone to Egypt. Exodus 6. 19 through 25, it goes a little deeper into the clans. Exodus 12, 1 through 4 is another small reference to the households. Exodus 24, 9 tells us that Moses went up with about 70 elders from the tribes of Israel. So elders and scribes were very important in this structure with the tribes, clans, and households as well. So there's more than enough deep diving here to keep you busy well past a week charting out these tribes, but it is fun. And then send me a copy of your chart to you the number seven ministries at gmail.com. And as always, I must remind you of my disclaimer. This study is in no way to take the place of studying the entire Bible. In fact, if you haven't studied the entire Bible from book to book, cover to cover, I suggest just doing that first before you dive into this study. This study is a study, an investigative deep dive, if you will, for those of you that have read the Bible and studied God's Word cover to cover and want to do a little deep diving into some rabbit trails in the Bible. I will provide questions, scriptures, and point of interest, if you will, that you can look up on your own, investigate and deep dive, asking God to help you discern and come to your own thoughts. In no way am I trying to influence you one way or another, period. My entire goal doing this series this year is so that you get into your Bibles even more and discover all the treasures that God has placed there for us. You will hear me mention over and over on my podcast, don't take my word for it. Get in your Bible and look it up yourself. I challenge you to challenge me and find the answers for yourself. That's right. I will bring you a message. I will back it up with scripture. I will give you prompts and I will put some questions out there that will make you go, I never thought of that or wow, that's something new. But Let's make this very clear. It's your job. That's right. Your job to be in God's or Yahweh's word daily. This is Tammy Becker. Hope you have a great week. See you back next time. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to another weekly episode of the Almighty God and Gospel Girl podcast. If you have a testimony you would like to share with us, please contact us through our website at uministries.com. That's Y-O-U-Ministries.com. Until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace.